Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And before I start, can I just say it's marvellous to have these four MPs back in Parliament. Yeah. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. The government said that the by-elections would be a referendum on his corporate tax cuts. Will the Prime Minister now admit that Australian voters right around this country rejected his $80 billion handout to big business, including $17 billion for the big banks? Or does the Prime Minister think that the voters in Perth and Braddon and Fremantle and Longman, they just got it wrong? Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, I thank the honourable member for his question. And Mr Speaker, we well remember the honourable member standing here some years ago saying lower company tax will result in more productivity, more investment, more jobs and higher wages. And we remember that. Of course, Mr Speaker, the microphone was on when he said that because we all know that he doesn't say normally, he doesn't say what he's seeking when he's on mic. He said, we saw him on his outback tour and uh, he's there, he's all mic'd up and he said, oh, I'm on mic. I can't say what I'm thinking. Well, Mr Speaker, the reality is Australians never know what the Leader of the Opposition is seeking because he says one thing to one group and another to another. What was he saying? What was he saying to the $11,000 a head fundraiser sponsored by Macquarie Bank and Genworth? I wonder what he was saying there. Do you think he was saying that company taxes should be higher? I'm sure he was trying to weasel his way around there, trying to tap back to an earlier position. You won't get any consistency from the Leader of the Opposition. All we know is that time and time again he tells people what they want to hear. He has no consistency, and that is why he cannot be trusted. He's failed Australians to give them straight answers on tax. He's failed just as he failed his members in the Australian Workers' Union to protect them. He, likes, he goes around and talks about penalty rates. Penalty rates, very important part of our industrial system, determined by the independent umpire, which he always said whose rulings he would support. But then, of course, when he was the leader of the AWU, one group of low-paid workers after another were abandoned by the Leader of the Opposition. He failed them as he fails Australians. When he's on mic, he doesn't say what he's thinking, so he's assured us. And, Mr Speaker, when he's off mic, he's no more reliable than when he's on. The member for Swan. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister update the House on how the government's plan for lower taxes will benefit working Australians and small businesses, including in the electorate of Swan. Is the Prime Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Mr Speaker, last week the Honourable Member and I saw firsthand how small businesses in his electorate of Swan are taking advantage of the lower business taxes that we have delivered and Labor would stop to increase investment and employment. Businesses like Thermo King West, a family-owned refrigeration business employing 23 workers, will now, according to its owner, Steve DeRui, invest more money back into the business and take on new apprentices as a result of that additional investment. And the member for Swan and I met two of those new apprentices being trained on the premises. Now, right across Australia, small family owned businesses like Thermo King West are increasing investment and creating jobs because they know they have the backing of our government that is committed to lower taxes. They know that our coalition, Liberal National Government, is committed to lower taxes. Under our government, Businesses with a turnover of up to $50 million will pay 25 per cent rate of tax, less than they would pay under Labor. Unlike the members opposite, the government understands the critical role of businesses in creating jobs, and that's why we're backing small and medium family-owned businesses with lower taxes. It's why we've seen 
record jobs growth, more, hundred, more than 400,000 jobs created last year alone and the lowest percentage of Australians of working age on welfare in 25 years. And that's the confidence, investment, employment that is helping to build a stronger economy and the stronger government revenues that come from it. That's why we're able to bring the budget back into balance a year earlier. It's why we're able to guarantee essential services, investing record amounts in hospitals, schools, infrastructure and security. And it's what's enabling us to deliver tax relief to families, to individuals, through our comprehensive personal income tax plan. We believe in lower taxes, and we want every Australian, beginning with low and middle income earners, to keep more of what they earn. And the personal income tax reform the parliament recently passed and which the opposition voted against delivers just that. It delivers immediate relief of up to $530 a year for working Australians while addressing bracket creep so that Australians are paying lower taxes for any extra dollar they earn. By the time the plan is delivered, 94 per cent of Australians will pay no more than 32 and a half cents for any extra dollar they earn. That's real reform. The member for Longman. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Why is the Prime Minister cutting $2.9 million from the Caboolture Hospital while giving $17 billion to the big banks? Prime Minister has the call. No, I'll, I'll be calling on the minister in a moment. While, while, while we welcome the honourable member back uh, from her, uh, uh, her absence, uh, Mr Speaker, the, the great lie that the government is cutting funding from Caboolture Hospital is one that the Minister for Health will now comprehensively refute, as we have done every day that Labor has uttered it. The Minister for Health. The Member for Greenway. Minister for Health. Thank support. you very much, Mr Speaker. And I want to back up what the Prime Minister says. What we saw in Queensland during that campaign from the ALP was a tissue of lies, an absolute farrago of dishonesty. How do we know this? How do we know this? Because in the Metro North area, which includes the Caboolture Hospital, what did Queensland Labor do in 2016-17? They cut funding to their own area, to their own hospitals, by $20 million. These are not our figures, these are their figures. A cut by Queensland Labor, about which the Leader of the Opposition was palpably silent, about which he said nothing, about which he put them in witness protection. What we saw was a $20 million cut from Queensland Labor. They're the facts. And what did we do on our side? In that period, there was a $120 million increase in federal funding to the Metro North area. Minus 20, Queensland Labor, plus 120, the federal coalition government. Those are the facts based on not just our figures, but the Queensland government's figures and those of the independent assessors in this space. So whilst we've gone up, they have reduced funding by $20 million. And what does that mean? That means that Queensland is providing less money for beds in Caboolture Hospital, less money for services in Caboolture Hospital, less money for other treatments in Caboolture Hospital. And at the same time, what we have just done is guarantee $11 million for increased drug and alcohol funding in Caboolture, an issue in relation to methamphetamines and the challenge on the streets, which was raised by so many people. So we're increasing funding. Queensland Labor is decreasing funding, and when it really counts, federal Labor hid the fact that their own people in their own state are taking money away from their own hospitals. The member for Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the impact of the government's legislated personal income tax cuts for all Australians, including in my electorate of Gilmore? Is the Treasurer aware of any other suggestions? 
The Treasurer has the call. Mr. Speaker, the government is on the side of those Australians who believe they should keep more of what they've earned. That's who we're on the side of, because that's what we believe. We believe that Australians should keep more of what they have earned. We do not believe that our tax relief package, legislated through the parliament, more than $140 billion in tax relief is a giveaway, like the Labor Party is, does, because we know it's their money. It's their money in the first place. And we believe Australians who work hard, running businesses out there as wage earners, should be able to keep more of what they have earned. It's not a giveaway. It's not your money to give away the Labor Party. It's their money that they should be able to keep. And that's what this side of the House believes, Mr Speaker. We believe in a fair go, Mr Speaker, but we also believe in a fair go for those who have a go. And those who are out there working hard, earning wages, they deserve the fair go of being able to keep more of what they have earned. That's why we legislated Opposed by the Labor Party, opposed by the Labor Party, we legislated personal income tax relief for all working Australians paying tax. Not just some, all working Australians paying tax, Mr. Speaker. Now the Labor Party voted against it, and they want to take a $140 billion tax relief legislated plan if they are elected and cut it in half, cut it clear in half, and take back take back the relief that those hard-working Australians deserve, and this parliament and the other place has legislated to deliver to those Australians. If you're voting Labor, you're voting for higher taxes. It's that simple, Mr Speaker. They want to take away the tax relief that this government has provided to them. Ten million taxpayers getting that immediate relief, including 50,000 in the member for Gilmore's electorate, that urgent, straight-up relief. But then we're dealing with bracket creep. We're making sure, particularly for younger people who look out over the next 10 years, and they see those tax brackets changing, and as they earn more, they won't be taxed more. And the end part of the plan is the strongest in that 94 per cent of Australians will not pay a marginal income tax rate greater than 32 and a half cents. That's the biggest tax relief, Mr Speaker, that the Australian people have seen for a long time, and it's been delivered by a government who believes in lower taxes because we believe in a fair go for those who have a go. We believe, Mr Speaker, that it's their money and they should get to keep more of what they have earned. And the government of the Reserve Bank says it's good for the economy. Phil Lowe said, the governor said just this past week, household disposable income growth will be supported by the reduction in personal taxes. So a stronger economy to support the services that Australia rely on and lower taxes to back in the hard-working effort of working Australians. The member for Braddon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The people of Braddon voted for more money for schools and hospitals, not banks. Instead of giving $17 billion to the big banks, why won't the Prime Minister support Labor's plan to invest $4.5 million in TASREACH health services, which would mean more Tasmanians can access vital health services? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, I, <coughs> I, uh, I thank the honourable uh, member for a question. And, uh, I note that uh, I think around, uh, around 58 more uh, electors in Braddon voted for the Labor Party at the by-election than they had at the general election. So there was a uh, there was a very there was a very small swing for the Labor Party, but it was a uh, but uh, it wasn't Members a on my it left. wasn't a it wasn't a result that would uh, set by-election records to say the least. But the honourable member is back. And we welcome her back. And the honourable member comes back, knowing, knowing that the Tasmanian economy is doing better now, better now than it has for many years, and it's doing better now because of Will Hodgman's Liberal government. It's doing better now because of the pro-business policies that we have delivered, and because one small and medium business after another in the electorate of Braddon is investing and employing. In fact, in the last monthly jobs figures, Tasmania saw an extra 2,100 new jobs. It was a very substantial increase in employment. And of course, it was a result 
of the encouragement that we are providing to business and investment. We are providing that encouragement and that is delivering the confidence that we're seeing across Tasmania and across the honourable member's electorate. And I have to say to the honourable member that the greatest threat to the jobs in her electorate would be the election of the party she is a member of to the federal government. Members on my left, just before I call the member for Melbourne, I inform the House that we have joining us in the gallery this afternoon Ros Bates, the Queensland Shadow Minister for Health, Ambulance Services and, and Women. On behalf of the House, I extend a warm welcome to you and I call the member for Melbourne. Questions to the Minister for Environment and Energy. And my questions about the modelling underpinning the final detailed design of the proposed National Energy Guarantee. In response to requests for the full modelling behind the claims about $550 a year drops in energy prices, all that was released was a single Excel spreadsheet file. Minister, will you today release the full modelling underpinning the final detailed design of the National Energy Guarantee before the coalition party room considers it tomorrow? Or does the government have no modelling beyond a single Excel spreadsheet? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Well, Mr Speaker, I appreciate the Greens' interest in our party room, Mr Speaker, because they are the party of the carbon tax, Mr Speaker. They are the party in partnership with the Labor Party, which saw electricity prices increase each and every year when they were in office. Each and every year, prices double. Now, Mr Speaker, the member from Melbourne should know better that the modelling that was undertaken by ASIL Allen was for the Energy Security Board, and it made it very clear in their detailed report that they allowed and made public their technology costs. They made public their fuel costs. They made public their capital costs. They made public, uh, Mr. Speaker, the exchange rate, the inflation rate, all the inputs which went into establishing that, together with the National Energy Guarantee, Australian households will be five hundred and fifty dollars a year better off, Mr. Speaker, and that will see the wholesale price of power come down by about 20 per cent, Mr Speaker. Now, that is significant. That means hundreds of thousands of dollars to be saved by hospitals, to be saved by supermarkets, millions of dollars to be saved by chemical manufacturers and paper manufacturers, blue-collar workers that the Greens don't even pretend to represent, Mr Speaker, because the, the Greens are all about ideology. The coalition, when it comes to energy policy, is focusing on engineering and economics, Mr Speaker. The reality, is, the reality is that we have listened to the independent experts. The, the reality is this policy has been backed by business, industry and consumer groups. And the reality is that this policy will reduce power prices, together with existing policies, by $550 a year. The member for Calair. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on how the government is supporting small businesses in regional Australia, including in the central west of New South Wales? And is the Deputy Prime Minister aware of any roadblocks to tax relief for regional Australians? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and uh, I thank the member for Clare for his, uh, for his question. Mr Speaker, when the regions are strong, so too is our nation, and we certainly see that at the moment. Uh, writ large, writ large, no, don't you start, and, and don't you start either. I mean, we, I mean, seriously, member for McMahon, seriously, you wouldn't know a region if you saw one, and quite frankly, your leader wouldn't either. I mean, he's. He's covered more territory than Burke and Wills or Tony Burke and the member for Wills lately. And quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, uh, he did Glenn Robbins proud. Russell Coit would have been laughing when he talked Deputy about. Deputy Prime Minister, we'll come back to the back to the question. The ignore, ignore the interjection. About, my mic's not on, so I can't say what I'm thinking. I can't say what I'm thinking. But further to the uh, member for Clare's question, Mr. Speaker, we have delivered. Member for more the Liberal and Nationals have delivered historic tax relief for hard-working mums and dads, for businesses right throughout the central west of New South Wales. And they are doing it tough, Mr Speaker. They are doing it tough. They need every dollar that they can get so that they can reinvest it in their own business, because that's what good small businesses do. 
They get a bit of tax relief. They reinvest it in their own business. They give that young Australian their first start. They give that older Australian who might be transitioning from one long career and, uh, and, and have fell on hard times, or indeed they need a new career, they, they get work with a small business, particularly one in a regional area, who is willing, willing to give them a go such as Barker's Butchery in Oberon. I visited with the member for Kalia. Uh, it's a good little small business. It was part of my small business roadshow that I dropped in there. Wayne Barker has had the business since 1978. He's having a go. They're the sorts of people that we want to back. They're the sorts of people that the Treasurer is backing with his historic tax relief. The lowest tax rate for 78 years, brought about thanks to a Liberal and Nationals government. Acres Bakery in Blaney. It's owned by Matthew and Denise Hutchison, another great little small business in the Central West. Now, the Central West is doing it tough because of the drought, but we're there backing them with tax relief. We're also backing infrastructure, such as uh, bridge replacements, $2.3 million, making sure that these regional communities are connected, making sure that we get those vital linkage points from Farmgate to, uh, to the rail line or to, on, on better roads, to ports, to the markets. Our free trade agreements that we've been able to broker with South Korea, Japan, China, Peru, thanks to the good work by the Trade Minister and his assistant, the member for Parks, making sure that we get those trade points backed up through better roads such as, uh, and bridges, such as Browns Creek Road Bridge, Blaney Street Overbridge and the Goodman Bridge, $2.5 million upgrade at Bathurst Airport, another piece of vital infrastructure, $10 million for Velocity Park under the Building Better Regions Fund. They're all funding measures that will go, Mr Speaker, if this man ever becomes Prime Minister. The member for Fremantle. Yeah. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. The people of Fremantle voted overwhelmingly for more money for schools and hospitals, not banks. So instead of giving $17 billion to the big banks, a policy for which no Liberal candidate in WA was prepared to argue, why won't the Prime Minister support Labor's plan to invest $5 million to build an urgent care clinic at Fremantle Hospital? The Minister for Health. The Minister for Health has the call. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we are just investing five million. We are investing an extra three point four billion dollars in funding for hospitals in Western Australia. And you know what? It was the West Australian Labor government that signed that agreement with the Prime Minister, that reached that agreement at the COAG earlier this year. And so on a bipartisan basis, what we saw is the commencement of a process that is now seen as part of a $30 billion increase in hospital funding around Australia, three Labor states and territories and three coalition states and territories sign up to more hospital funding. And what, what do we see in Western Australia? In Labor's last year in government, federal funding was $1.4 billion. This year it's $2.2 billion, but it will grow under the Prime Minister's agreement, the Coalition Government's agreement, to $3.2 billion, and that will be a $3.5 billion increase in federal funding to Western Australia for hospitals. And at the same time, you know what's interesting? At the same time, we know from what the West Australian Government has told us, the Leader of the Opposition and the federal ALP tried to stop WA from signing the agreement. They tried to stop Western Australia from signing up to more hospital funding. So when you understand what this Leader of the Opposition is about, it's not about more hospital funding in WA or Queensland because he was silent in Queensland at the slashing cuts of the Palaszczuk government. It's not about more funding in Western Australia because he tried to stop the Western Australian Labor government from signing up to an agreement with the federal government, it's about taking any chance to take an advantage at the cost of the very people he purports to represent. And that's his history, that's his practice, that's his, his approach when he was not just the leader of the opposition, not just a minister in the previous government, but when he was a union leader ripping money off the most vulnerable workers. So at the end of the day, 
what you see is $3.4 billion of additional federal funding for Western Australia for hospitals, an extra, an extra uh, uh, increase from $1.4 billion to a more than doubling of $3.2 billion over the period from when Labor was last in government to when our new hospital uh, agreement reaches its final year. That's real investment, and you can only do that. You can only do that when you've got the economy which supports the ability to invest in new hospitals, in new treatments and new medicines. The member for O'Connor. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. Will the Minister update the House on how the government is helping Australians through lower taxes, including those in my electorate of O'Connor? Is the Minister aware of any threats posed by adopting a different plan? The Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. I'd like to thank the member for O'Connor for his question, and I'd like to publicly thank him for inviting me to his electorate to hear firsthand what a great job he's doing on the ground, particularly his role in providing important tax relief for his electorate of O'Connor. He, like every member of this team, believes how important it is to provide tax relief for hard-working Australians, because we understand that Australians work hard for their money, and their money belongs to them. We get that, but plainly those opposite do not. That's why we have been able to deliver tax relief for small, medium and family-sized enterprises that employ around 5 million Australians, including 20,000 businesses in the members' own electorate of O'Connor. And it's why we have also delivered personal income tax relief for more than 61,000 low- and middle-income earners in O'Connor and around 10 million people right around the country, thanks to our legislated personal income tax plan. And we did that despite those opposite fighting us every single step of the way. Now, he asks me about the threats. Are there any threats? And standing in the retiree forums that he organised, I did hear a lot about those threats, particularly the threat of the Leader of the Opposition's mega retiree tax, a $55 billion hit on retirees, those people who can least afford it. And of course, what that will mean for the member is around 6,000 members of his electorate will lose their tax refunds under Labor. Now, for some of those people, I heard that that represents about 30 per cent, 30 per cent of their income. And we know that it will hit around a million a million people right across the country. That's grandmas, that's grandpas, that's men and women, that's mums and dads. Shame, Labor, shame for wanting to steal the tax refunds of hard-working Australians because these people, these people are not the top end of town. They're not the millionaires that he likes to pretend. In fact, 96 per cent of them have got a taxable income of less than $87,000. These are low and middle income Member earners, for Rankin. not millionaires, Member for Rankin's as the Ward. Leader of the Opposition likes to claim. So what is it that the Leader of the Opposition has got against aspirational Australians? What is it that he has against self-reliance, people wanting to be self-reliant in retirement? And what other nasties does he have up his sleeve? Because we know he won't tell us everything when he knows that the microphone is on. The only promise you can trust from the Leader of the Opposition is that he has his hand in your pocket. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Today, Nine News has reported that the almost half a billion dollars of taxpayer money that the Prime Minister offered to a small private foundation in a closed-door meeting was rushed out of the department in just 24 hours. Whether it's taxpayer-funded new, new coal-fired power stations or just private foundations run by his friends, why is this Prime Minister so reckless with taxpayers' money? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. The honourable member demeans himself and his party with his smears, uh, but I'll ask the Minister for the Environment to deal with the timeline and the process relating to that grant. Members on my left. The members for Burt and Bass, 
the Minister for the Environment has to call. Well, we know, we know the Labor Party is only raising this issue because they've abandoned the voters in the seat of Herbert. They've abandoned the, so, seat of, the, the voters in the seat of Leichhardt. They've abandoned the voters in the seat of Flynn. They've abandoned the voters in the seat of Capricornia. And they've abandoned the voters in the seat of Dawson. 64,000 people are employed with the reef, Mr Speaker. It provides more than $6 billion to the Australian economy, Mr Speaker. And it has been the Turnbull government that has raised and supported extra money for the reef. And we know that my department has made it clear in a report to the Senate that the partnership that is established through a grant agreement is in accordance with the relevant requirements of the Public Governance and Accountability Act 2013 and the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines. The process to establish the grant included the development of grant guidelines by the department to specify the intended outcome and conditions of the grant and an assessment for and due Ari. diligence review by the Department of the Foundation's proposal responding to the guidelines. Now, Mr Speaker, the Department made it very clear, and I am quoting the Department. The Department assessed that the Foundation's proposal represents value for money and is an appropriate use of Commonwealth sought resources, Mr Speaker. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the Leader of the Opposition knows the only reason he is raising this is because under the Labor Party, the Environment Department's funding for reef projects was around 50 per cent lower than what it is under the Coalition, Mr Speaker. That under the Labor Party, their last year in office, base funding for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority was nearly, one half, was nearly a half of what it is today, Mr Speaker. The Labor Party knows that when they were in government, they put the reef on the path to the in danger what in the in danger list, Mr. Speaker. And the Labor Party knows when they were in government, when they were in government, that they had no long-term plan and no funding for the reef. Mr. Speaker, only the coalition will stand up for regional jobs in Member Queensland and will support the reef with a record investment of funding. The member for Brisbane. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the Minister update the House on the importance of having strong and consistent border protection policies? What action is the government taking against groups seeking to undermine the success of these border protection measures? The Minister for Immigration and Home Affairs. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Brisbane uh, for his question. And, uh, Recognise the fact that, Mr. Speaker, it's now been 1,478 days since the last successful boat arrival. So, this government has taken control of our borders. When Labor was in government, they lost control of the borders, Mr. Speaker. And the worst part is that Labor has not learned the lesson of six years of the Rudd Gillard Rudd years. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that they presided over 50,000 people coming on 800 boats and 1,200 people. <laughs> Drowned at sea. They put 8,000 children into detention. And, Mr. Speaker, at the next election, they promised to do it all again. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, the left of the Labor Party is dictating policy in relation to this particular area. And we know that over the course of the last couple of weeks, the ACTU and others have been out there calling for a shift in the Labor Party's position to weaken Labor's position on border protection. But that is exactly what Julia Gillard fell for, and it's exactly what Kevin Rudd fell for, Mr. Speaker. Now we aren't going to allow the people smugglers to get back into business, and people who believe that somehow this problem has been dealt with and the problem has gone away don't recognise that we've turned back 33 boats over the last couple of years. We've disrupted over 70 attempts to put people onto boats to send them to Australia, and Mr. Speaker. We've already seen tens of thousands of people cross the Mediterranean at the beginning of this year into Europe. The problem has not gone away. Now, Mr Speaker, we've secured our borders, but we've done much more than that. We have gone through people who are here as non-citizens, that is, those people who are here on visas, and we have cancelled more visas of criminals in the last 12 months than Labor did in six years. So, Mr Speaker, we've been able to 
deal with a number of outlaw motorcycle gang members who are involved in the distribution of ice. They are the criminals who are responsible for importation and distribution of drugs in this country. But, Mr Speaker, at the same time, we've been able to get off Manus and Nauru, 371 of the people that Labor put on Manus and Nauru. I did not put a single person on Manus or Nauru, but I am getting them off. The Labor Party put them on because they lost control of our borders. And, Mr Speaker, as sure as night follows day, if this Leader of the Opposition is elected as Prime Minister in this country, those detention centres will refill overnight. And the fact is, the fact is that when you look across the back bench, there is one after the other who advocates a watering down of Labor's position. And what they would result in is giving control back to the people smugglers who would see people back on boats, kids drowning at sea, and kids back into detention. And for that, Mr. Speaker, they should be condemned. Members on both sides, the manager of opposition business. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday, the Environment Minister said there was extensive due diligence between the Prime, when the, before the Prime Minister offered a small private foundation almost half a billion dollars in taxpayers' money in a closed door meeting on the 9th of April. But today, the foundation's CEO explained that no one in the foundation was contacted and she wasn't even aware there was a due diligence process underway. Could the Prime Minister now give us three minutes detailing the extensive due diligence that his minister referred to? Members on my left, the Minister for the Environment has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It might help the House to run through a timeline because the decision to make this funding available was the result of a considered process. Last May in 2017, the minister, just pause there was for a second. Members on my left, I'm trying to hear the answer. Minister has the call. Interdepartmental task force led by my department to deal with the challenges facing the reef. This led to a MyEFO announcement of $57 million. Mr. Speaker. I then took th two submissions through the ERC process in March, which included seeking further funding for water quality, tackling the crown of thorns starfish, reef science, indigenous engagement and Garumpa's on water management program, and a proposal to establish a partnership with a non-government organisation, which was the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. This was based on three things. The Great Barrier Reef Foundation's proven track record in leveraging philanthropic support as Australia's largest reef-dedicated charity. The Foundation's long-standing extensive experience working with my department and other key stakeholders for more than a decade. And the first phase of due diligence by my department, which looked at its governance, structure, constitution, project management, fundraising history, capacity for growth, board composition and scientific expertise. Following ERC agreement, an interdepartmental committee was established to progress this proposal, and I was given authority to approach the foundation, which occurred on 9 April, to determine whether they were interested in entering into a partnership for, for the Ballarat benefit of warned. the reef, subject to the successful negotiation of a partnership agreement and final phase of due diligence. Over the next two weeks, the department worked with the foundation to develop the fundamental principles of the partnership, which included governance, decision-making, risk-making, reporting, financial man management and other things. I'm, I formally wrote on the 22nd of April to the Foundation Chair outlining these collaboration principles, making it clear that any Australian government funds was dependent on negotiating and executing a new grant agreement. The Foundation Board agreed to these principles and agreed in a letter back to me on the 26th of April. On the 29th of April, the government announced our funding commitment and was included in the budget on the 8th of May. On the 24th of May, consistent with the government's grant guidelines, I approved the partnership grant lines and announced the necessary and outlining the necessary requirements to be included in the foundation's application, which were published on my website. On the 29th of May, the foundation uh, formalised their proposal, and on the 20th of June, under Section 71 of the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act, I approved the grant to the foundation based on a recommendation from my department and a second state of due diligence, which included as well work by the Australian government solicitor. My department concluded that this grant would meet the government's policy objective to protect and manage the Great Barrier Reef, represent value for money, and was consistent with the provisions of the Governance and Accountability Act. The member for Karangabat. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment and Energy. Will the Minister update the House on what the government is doing to lower energy prices for Australian households and businesses, including in my home state of Victoria? How would alternative plans affect energy prices? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Corangamite and her hard work in trying to drive down energy prices because in Victoria they have the second highest prices in the country, Mr. Speaker. In Victoria they cheered on the Labor government, the closure of Hazelwood, and in Victoria, Mr. Speaker, AEMO have indicated there could be up to a 43 per cent chance of load shedding, Mr Speaker. That is a result of the Labor government in Victoria not putting lower power prices at the top of the priority list, Mr Speaker. In contrast, the coalition government has been doing exactly that. We've intervened in the gas market to get more gas available to Australians before it goes offshore. We've abolished the ability of the networks to game the system, which will save Australian customers billions of dollars. We've secured a better deal for Australian households as they've moved on to better market offers from the more expensive standing offers. And our plan is working. The wholesale cost of electricity is down around 25 per cent of this year, with the price last week at $68 a megawatt hour compared to $101 a megawatt hour for the same time the year before. And on the 1st of July, power bills are coming, have come down in New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia, and hopefully in Victoria when they do their resetting in January of next year. And this is saving households hundreds of dollars and businesses as well, Mr Speaker. Now, the National Energy Guarantee will consolidate this progress, with the average Australian household seeing their bill come down by around $550 from the National Energy Guarantee and the other activities we have underway. And the wholesale price will come down by about 20 per cent, which could be worth millions of dollars to energy intensive uh, customers, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, you don't have to take my word for it. Listen to what the Queensland Chamber, the Queensland Chamber of Industry and Commerce, representing 400,000 plus Queensland small business owners, said. At the end of the day, the National Energy Guarantee promises what we've all been waiting for: a downward pressure on electricity prices and policy certainty. BHP, Australia, the biggest user of power in South Australia. We expect the guarantee will result in lower power prices. The Business Council of Australia, representing thousands and millions of workers in various forms across the country, it's a practical, workable solution that prioritises reliable and affordable power. The NEG is a game changer and has the full support of business. And the National Farmers Federation, support for the National Energy Guarantee is support for certainty. Our message is pretty simple. We want some policy certainty for us is the best game in town. So, Mr Speaker, while the Labor Party will accelerate the closure of coal-fired power stations, the Labor Party are obsessed with emissions. We are focused on prices and reliability. The National Energy Guarantee will do exactly that. The member for Port Adelaide. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that the former Prime Minister, the member for Warringah, has ridiculed claims that power prices will fall under the Prime Minister's National Energy Guarantee, saying, and I quote, well, frankly, pigs might fly? Does the Prime Minister agree with the man who replaced? Deputy Prime Minister will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. Uh, independent assessment of the Energy Security Board, the almost uh, unanimous views of industry groups and business leaders around the country, all of whom support the National Energy Guarantee as a means of ensuring that we will have more affordable energy. The honourable member knows very well what happens when you are now allow ideology and idiocy to take charge of energy policy. He knows very well what happens there on in my South left. Australia, where you have the most expensive and the least reliable electricity in Australia. The time has come for engineering and economics. The National Energy Guarantee delivers that. And the Energy Security Board, comprising five of the most expert, numerate members of the community associated with energy policy, has delivered this policy, delivered this plan. It's a good one. It has more support 
across the community than any energy policy I have seen in decades. And that's why, Mr Speaker, it deserves the support of the opposition and all honourable members. The member for Grey. Thank you. The member for Grey has a call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister uh, for Defence. Uh, uh, for the defence industry. My question to the minister is, can he update the House on the recent decisions by the government that are creating jobs and building the defence industry, and how does this compare with the approaches of the past? The Minister for Defence Industry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Gray for his question. I can tell him and the House that in late June the government announced that BAE Systems Australia would build the nine anti-submarine warfare frigates at a cost of $35 billion in an Australian shipyard at Osborne, using Australian workers, Australian steel, creating jobs here in Australia, partnering with the ASC shipbuilding, which will be hived off from the ASC submarine company. So we are creating the sovereign defence industry in shipbuilding that we promised to do over two years ago, Mr Speaker. A $35 billion commitment to our naval shipbuilding industry, driving highly sophisticated jobs in a high technology uh, industry, which would never have happened if the Labor Party never. had remained in power. Never. Mr. Speaker. Never, the last never. naval ship that would ever have been built in this country would have been the HMAS Sydney, which rolled off the, uh, the, the line in uh, this year Mr. Speaker, as the third of the air warfare destroyers. So the Turnbull government, Mr. Speaker, investing in our defence industry, creating jobs all around Australia. BAE has already pre-qualified over 550 companies, small and medium enterprises, in their supply chain around Australia. And it's a national project. 160 of those are in Victoria, 80 of them are in Western Australia, uh, 100 in, in South Australia, 57 in Queensland, seven in the Northern Territory, eight in Tasmania, and, in, and about 126 in, in New South Wales, Mr Speaker. So spread right around the country, 4,000 jobs directly uh, in the project and in the direct supply chain, Mr Speaker. This is a transformative project for our manufacturing sector. Companies around the country, Mr Speaker, represented in, in coalition electorates, have been pre-qualified by BAE. Way out evacuation systems in Duncan, Mr. Speaker, that do manufacture specialised signage equipment. SLCE Watermakers Australia, that manufacture reverse osmosis machines in the seat of Brisbane. Uh, the Advanced Focus Company, they provide advisory services on manufacturing processes in Boothby, Mr. Speaker. Owen International, they provide specialist equipment like flares, landing aid systems, and video imaging systems in North Sydney, Mr Speaker. So this story is endless. One Australian SME after another being part of the national security of the country, being part of the defence of the nation, building the regionally superior anti-submarine warfare frigate, the Hunter class project here in Australia, creating Australian jobs, using Australian steel in an Australian shipyard, protecting our nation now and into the future. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Environment Minister. In his previous answer, the Minister claimed there was extensive due diligence and that that examined the fundraising history of the Foundation. On 6 August, the Environment Minister said the Foundation had raised $80 million. On 10 August, he said it had raised $60 million. And a few moments later, in the same interview, the figure had gone to $65 million. When the Minister can't even give a straight answer on how much they raised, yet says this was part of the due diligence. How can the government claim there was any due diligence on a foundation they didn't even contact? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Well, Mr Speaker, that from a member who gave them $12.5 million himself, Mr Speaker, and in a press release from the member for Watson in 2012, and I quote, this is what he said about the foundation. It pr protects and preserves the reef, Mr Speaker. It will ensure that the reef's va unique values are protected, Mr. Speaker. They were the words. They were the words for the member for Watson. And, Mr. Speaker, when we announced our half a billion dollars for the reef, what do you think the member for Sydney said? Always good for a quote. She welcomed the additional funding, Mr. Speaker. She welcomed the additional funding. Now, 
Mr. Speaker, when it comes, when it comes to the amount of money that the foundation has raised, um, we do know, we do know that it is Australia's largest reef charity, and we do know that Anna Marsden, that Anna Marsden said to the 7:30 report, and I quote from her interview. I can absolutely confirm that we have raised over $90 million. Now, these are audited figures. Now, if you go to her website, if you go to her website, we are the lead fundraisers for the Great Barrier Reef, and over 18 years have raised over $90 million. Now, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the breakdown of their funding, we know that about two-thirds, two-thirds have come from private and philanthropic. Um, sources, Mr. Speaker. We also know that the state government of Queensland has contributed quite significantly, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is, the fact is, the foundation has raised tens of millions of dollars from the private sector and from the <coughs> philanthropic sector, Mr. Speaker, and has had money from both the federal government when Labor was in power, from the federal government when we were in power, and from the state Labor government. The Manager of Opposition Business. I'd ask the Minister to table the Google search that constituted due diligence that he was just referring to. Is the Minister quoting from confidential documents? Yes. The Member for Page. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources. Will the Minister update the House on how the government is providing financial support to farmers and building drought resilience, including in my electorate of Page. The Minister for Agriculture. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I can thank the honourable member for his question and his interest in this drought that is developing much of eastern Australia, and particularly in his electorate. This is an evolving situation and one in which the government will continue to be agile in. Uh, it's one in which we understand that it's not just farmers that hurt, it's also small communities that hurt. So it's important we understand that under the agreements we have with the state, is that the state's responsibilities under the drought is to look after animal welfare, the freight and fodder. It's the federal government's responsibility to look after human welfare. And I'm proud to say that since uh, we've come to power, we've invested over $1.4 billion, not only in concessional loans, but in direct support to family households and the communities. And only in the last couple of weeks, We've increased that household support to farming families to $37,626. That's to help them put bread and butter on the table, to take the household pressures off them, to let them have some clear thinking. But to complement that, we've invested another $25 million in more rural financial counselling services. $8.5 million of those are putting new boots on the ground. This is an investment in the real angels that are out there, that sit around farmers' kitchen tables that get underneath the bonnet of our farmers' businesses and help them make the tough decisions, to make the strategic decisions about their future. That's an investment in not only agriculture but our people. But we're also looking towards preparedness. We're making big investments into pests and weeds. Pests and weeds cost agriculture around $6 billion a year. $35 million has been spent in ensuring that we increase farm productivity to ensure they get from one drought to the next. It's important we've also brought the banks on this journey with them. We bought them, kicking and screaming and offsetting the farm management deposits, the $6.62 billion in farm management deposits the bankers have put, banks have from farmers who put aside money in the good times to offset against their loans. That will save farmers tens of thousands of dollars into the future. That's an investment in agriculture's future. We've got the banks, who are the capital providers to agriculture, to come on that journey with us. But we've also made an additional $11.4 million investment into mental health. That's on top of the new investment around allowing the rebate, the Medicare rebate, to be given to those to be able to undertake uh, psychological assistance online for those farms that are doing it tough, to be able to do it in the dignity and sanctity of their own home. But I say to every farming family, the story of agriculture is a good one. The story of agriculture is just add rain. And I can tell you that when the rain comes, the good times will come. And your government, the Australian people, will stand shoulder to shoulder with you because we believe not only in you, we not only in agriculture, but we believe in your communities. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Environment Minister. Earlier in question today, the Environment Minister said the Department assessed that the, found the Foundation's proposal 
when did the department receive the foundation's proposal? Was it before or after they were offered half a billion dollars? The Minister for the Environment and Energy has the call. Mr. Mr Speaker, the member for Watson wasn't listening very carefully because I said on the 29th of May the foundation finalised their proposal. Now, Mr Speaker, what is very clear is that when we met firstly on the 9th of April with the foundation, with the foundation to solicit their to, to elicit whether they were interested in, 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 uh, on my left. in, in partnering with members the on my left. Um, when we met with the foundation, well, I would have thought the member for Watson would welcome, like the member for Sydney, would welcome half a billion dollars into the reef to underpin regional jobs. That's the key here, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, the fact is. There was an extensive process of my department working together with the foundation, and as I made it very clear, when I wrote to the foundation chair, I made it clear that the formal offer of Australian, any Australian government funds is dependent on negotiating and executing a new grant agreement. They re we received their final proposal on the 29th of May, and on the 20th of June, under Section 71 of the Public Performance and Accountability Act, I approve the grant to, grant to the Foundation. Now, having considered a detailed assessment of the application by my department, which recommended to me, and I quote, that this would meet the government's policy objective to protect and manage the Great Barrier Reef, and I quote, would represent value for money and a proper use of Commonwealth Member resources. For and I quote, would be consistent with the provisions of the Governance and Accountability Act. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we have succeeded in putting a record amount of funding into the Barrier Reef, where Labor failed, Mr. Speaker, where Labor failed. Money into saving the reef and advancing its health, Mr. Speaker. Tackling the Crown of Thorns staffing. Investing in the science, Mr. Speaker. Partnering with farmers to prevent sediment, nitrogen, nitrogen and pesticide runoff. Mr. Speaker, what did Australia's chief scientist say when we announced this half a billion dollars? He said it's a great day for the reef and it's a great day for science, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> what, did the, what did the head of the tourism operators in that part of Queensland say, Mr Speaker. He said it underpins regional jobs in Queensland, Mr Speaker. <laughs> and Mr Speaker, what did the chair of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority say when we announced our half a beard? He said this is a game changer, Mr Speaker. Now I want to make it clear. There is a hundred page document between the government and the foundation, all the of which minister's is public. time has concluded. The member for Dunkley has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Urban Infrastructure and Cities. Will the Minister update the House on how the government's investment in infrastructure compares to previous periods, including in my state of Victoria and in my electorate of Dunkley, and how this investment flows down to businesses? How would other ideas undermine the success? The Minister for Urban Infrastructure. Uh, well, I do thank the member for Dunkley. And it's been terrific to visit the member for visit the uh, uh, Baxter Station with the member for Dunkley on several occasions, because the member for Dunkley is delivering for his electorate. In the 2016 election, he promised four million dollars for a business case for the Fra Frankston to Baxter rail upgrade, and that is being delivered. But he went further than that, because in the 2018 budget. What did the member for Dunkley deliver? He secured a commitment from the Turnbull government for $225 million for the construction of this upgrade. And on the 17th of July this year, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Victorian opposition leader, Matthew Guy, promised that a Victorian Liberal National Government would match this with a further $225 million. Mr Speaker, the Baxter duplication, the Baxter train is leaving the station. 
It's an increasingly popular train, Mr. Speaker. It's an increasingly popular train because on the 31st of July, the member for Grainley tried to jump on board with a manoeuvre he performs from time to time. Uh, ACCC, a set of initials well known in public policy. Here it stands for the Albo Copy and Claim Credit Manoeuvre, and we saw the that on minister, the 31st of July. The Minister will refer to members by their correct titles. I've made but this the, point the over true and over again. Credit, Mr. Speaker, the true credit belongs to the member for Dunkley. He got this train moving, and all around Australia, the infrastructure train is moving. Mr. Speaker, the Coalition investing $8 billion a year compared to $6 billion under the Rudd. Gillard Rudd government, a $75 billion infrastructure investment program over a 10-year period. It's all there in black and white, Mr Speaker, in the ABS Engineering Construction Activity, uh, a document I know you personally are very familiar with, 8762.0, for any who may not be familiar with it, the value of public sector transport engineering construction work done in the most recent quarter, $5.9 billion an all-time high. And where did it stand some 10 years ago, Mr Speaker? Some 10 years ago, in the first Rudd era, it's 79.3 per cent higher than during the first Rudd era, Mr Speaker. The value of public sector transport engineering construction work, $5.9 billion. The Turnbull government record spending on infrastructure. That means more jobs for Australians. It means congestion-busting projects all around Australia. It means getting on with the job of delivering outcomes for Australians when it comes to infrastructure. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, on that stirring note, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.